Library's Books and Blooms. And this evening, we are very fortunate to have as our keynote speaker, Bunny Williams. Not only, uh, not only are we fortunate to have her speak to us tonight, but we're also fortunate that she is opening her garden to us tomorrow during the garden tour. Bunny's Garden and Paige Dickey's Garden in Falls Village, two other wonderful gardens in Cornwall, Roxana Robinson and Debbie Jones, all gardeners here this evening. So thank you. I hope to see everybody at the gardens. It's supposed to be 80 degrees tomorrow, sunny with a slight breeze. <laughs> right, Roxanne? Yes. <laughs> and we hope to see you there. When you have finished visiting the gardens, we all hope that you'll stop at the Souterrain Gallery to see an exhibit on trees, paintings by Sean McDavid, which are absolutely lovely. So it's a good way to culminate the weekend. Anyway, I'd like to introduce Jane Garmy, who will introduce uh, Bunny Williams. Jane is another cor avid Cornwall gardener whose garden has been on our garden tour several times. She's the author of many gardening books and has spoken not only in Cornwall, but in New York City and in other places. So please welcome Jane. Bunny, but as I thought about it today, it's a real challenge because there is um, it's an awful lot to tell you about her. Um, in her professional life, uh, she is uh, she's not a good designer. She's a star. She's a legend. Um, she has uh, uh, she's uh, she worked for many many years with Parrish Hadley before starting her own business. She's won I think every every major prize in the design world. Uh, she, uh, she also has started her own company with furniture and decorative objects for the uh, accessories and objects for the house. She has a very interesting partnership with um, uh, the Ballad uh, Catalog. She's done, she's done projects uh, not only in this country, but in Mexico, Canada, Europe. Um, there's a lot there. Um, she also, she and John Rosselli, her husband, for many years ran what was not just a garden store in New York, but the most imaginative, uh, the most imaginative, interesting, and, and very, very special store, and something that anybody who went there <coughs> uh, did not forget lightly. Um, <coughs> she's also published five books. Uh, one of her, her newest book, which is uh, she's going to talk to you about tonight, um, but also one of her books was on uh, her house and also on her garden in Falls Village. And on a local level, um, she's hardly been <coughs> reclusive. Her garden, as uh, Marnie told you, as Monelle told you, is incredibly special. It's a garden that should be seen many times. It grows, it expands, there's a, 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 a woodland garden, a parterre, a stunning kitchen garden, a sunken garden. Um, it's, it's an absolute, uh, it's, it's one of the great treasures of the Northwest Corner. Uh, many years ago, I bought two of my cousins who are um, huge English garden uh, aficionados, um, highly critical. And I took them to Bunny's garden, and afterwards one of them said to me, yeah, world-class garden. Uh, so we should all go take, be sure to take advantage of tomorrow and go see it. Um, also, uh, we have money to thank for uh, what is the most, um, the most successful, uh, the most well-known uh, fundraising uh, event in Northwest Cornwall which is trade secrets. The idea just sort of happened to begin in Bunny's garden. It was Bunny's idea. It started uh, as a small rare plants and uh, with the addition of Garden Antique Show in Bunny's garden and it was there for, uh, for three or four years before it moved to larger quarters. It, um, <coughs> I think last year it attracted a thousand people from as far away as Texas. It's an extraordinary event. Um, Another newer event on, uh, 
on Bunny's agenda is the Country Mutt Show, which also brings her to Cornwall next week. And I have a feeling this is going to grow in just the same way as Trade Secrets. I mean, there are some very, very interesting competitions going on. There's, uh, I think, the best spots, uh, the, uh, a garden, uh, uh, dog tricks are being taken very, very seriously. <laughs> You can have your dog compete in that. Or uh, the, the, uh, um, the prize that I'm the most interested in is um, the best lap dog of over 40 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, just one moment before I introduce Bunny, I want to tell you about her newest venture. She really, uh, Bunny has made an imprint on the Northwest Corner, and her latest venture is um, many, many years ago when actually I lived in Falls Village before I came to Cornwall, which is how I got to know Bunny, uh, there was a market that closed down and the, the, the store it was in and the center on the main street of Falls Village has been <laughs> empty and derelict for I think about 25 years. Uh, <coughs> Bunny has rescued it. Uh, she has, um, uh, if you go down the main street now, you see a very, very attractive building which is going to open in the beginning of August. It's called 100 Main, uh, after, it's on the main street, and it's going to be a cooperative for, uh, for, for, for regional artists, artisans, craftspeople. Um, I think it's going to be a very special place. So um, I just want to say we're not just pleased to have Bunny speaking tonight. <coughs> we're thrilled, honored, and delighted, and you will have a wonderful time. Thank you so much, Jane, and thank you all for coming. It's very, very sweet of all of you to show up on this night, and I'm excited about having a lot of you come to the garden, I hope, tomorrow. Um, I, I came to this area 40, I mean, 37 years ago, and my first book I call A Love Affair with a House, and I really think that that's what I, I have had for, I still am having it, and if you really care about your home and where you live, it, it's something that has to be nurtured. It's just like a romance, it's just like your children. You have to take care of it. You have to look at it, think about it, and the, the more you do, the better it gets. And I, I know with myself, I didn't do my house all at one time. Uh, a lot of the projects you're gonna see, I have to do them at one time. <laughs> the clients buy a house and they wanna move it in two years, and so we have to do the whole thing. When I bought the house in Falls Village, um, we couldn't afford to even furnish the living room. So room sat empty and it got done over a period of time. But then that to me is what makes it interesting. You collect, you buy, you maybe paint a room, you repaint a room. Um, and I'm hoping today that maybe through looking at some of these pictures, you might think of one little thing that you want to do when you go home. It's not that I expect anybody to recreate these interiors, but I know that my career and how I got where I am is looking, going to see things, always. I'm self-taught, I wasn't educated. I went to work in New York when I was 20 years old in an antique shop. I worked there for two years, and then I went on to work at this firm, Parrish Hadley. I always say I went to the University of Parrish Hadley. And I went in as a secretary. I had low man on the totem pole, um, and I did everything. I mean, I had to learn to make the beds, and I always say to my staff, and they, we go on an installation, I said, remember, you're the housekeeper now. <laughs> this isn't a fancy job. We have to sweep, vacuum, wash the windows, make sure it's perfect. So you learn this over a period of time, and then in 1988, I started my own firm. But it was always looking, it was always look, looking at things, traveling, going to houses, going to Europe, as much as I could see, it sort of squirreled away in the brain. And you make your own, you make your own statement with the things that you put together. Uh, this is not going forward. Where is our technical person? She was earlier. She needs her own. It's not, it's, it's not going forward. 
did earlier. Well, let's see. 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 Let's What do we like? What's our style? What is it? What are we really? Who are we? And, you know, everything works. I don't think there's any right or wrong, but it's important to often know what you're about. Um, do you want a more modern, cleaner interior? This was a, a penthouse in New York that I did um, for a client, and I'd done their apartment before that was much more traditional, and we decided we wanted this apartment, this new addition to their apartment, to look like a New York City loft. Um, this was another apartment where the client had a much more traditional house in Long Island and got a New York pied a and said, I want something snappy and fresh. And so we introduced antiques, modern furniture, wonderful painted floors um, to, to have a real style of a New York apartment. This is a more traditional space. This is a house, yes, this is. Um, a wonderful house, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later. This was actually the house that the Kennedys, that Bobby and Ethel Kennedy raised their family. And it was, they lived there forever, it was rather tired. And my clients bought it, who had four children, and we made it back into a family house. And this was a house that had some family pieces, we added some modern furniture, um, and put, put together a house that I always think that when you, when you combine different styles and periods, you have something that stands the test of time. You never think it's dated. It could be, this room could have been done yesterday, it could have been done 20 years ago, and hopefully in 20 years in the future, it will still look fresh and clean. Um, a family room, much more country, uh, big comfortable sofas, more pattern, uh, wood furniture, and a lower key, a, a more relaxed uh, interior. I always think that you should start looking at your house at the front door. Whatever you come into, I don't know about you, but up here I find uh, nobody comes to my front door. <laughs> they come in the back door. So I have to rethink my whole house because I'm like, well, I have a front hall, it's very pretty, but I don't think in 25 years more than five people have come in. And that's only when I drag them there. Uh, so everybody comes in the back door so that the, what was the mud room had to get sort of dressed up and look a little bit better than just having the rubber boots and the uh, rubber coats hanging all over the place. So whether you whether you come in your front door or your back door, that's people's first impression. It's the first thing they see. Um, this is, I'm sure, like everyone's house. Um, but this was this was kind of an interesting story. I had these clients who bought one of those houses in Florida that was done by a developer. And the outside's very fancy, but inside they get nothing. I mean, they, it's sort of sheetrock walls, and it was terrible. And I said to the clients, you're not going to like this. So not only did I have to decorate it, but I had to do the, all the architecture for it. So designing isn't just about buying furniture. It's often sitting down with architects, doing the drawings, creating the spaces. Um, and we end up doing a lot of that. This, this is the house in Washington, which interestingly enough, didn't have a, a center stair hall. It had a little th a tiny hall, little parlor rooms, and we ended up ha deciding to knock out some of the rooms and create a pretty staircase, so we made an entrance. One of the things I love to do, and you'll see it in work, I love stencil floors, I love these painted floors, and particularly in wood houses, they often did that because they didn't want a marble floor, they didn't want something fancy, but they wanted to kind of dress it up. Our house has a stencil floor, and I love them. I love, I look at patterns of parquet floors and come up with ideas of way that you, can, you just scrape the floor, and then somebody comes in and uses different stains and does a wonderful stencil pattern. Here's another one in a, a house in, in uh, Bucks County, in, oh, it's outside of uh, Wilmington, Delaware, and wonderful big um, entrance hall, but this marvelous, um, Floor, the, the painted floor just gives the space um, a little bit of a snap and a character. Um, of course, you can always have a wonderful rug. Um, I grew up in Virginia, and I don't know if anybody knows Virginia, but the, 
the dirt in Virginia is red clay. I mean, it is. That's why the, all their, they have all those brick buildings, the red clay. That's the soil. So my mother always had a red oriental rug in the front hall so that we weren't screamed at constantly with our boots. Um, and furniture and combinations. I love, I love having one bowl statement in an entrance hall. And I think it's really interesting to mix different things together. This is an early Chinese chess with a marvelous contemporary painting over it. And this is a way that we can sort of make things stand the test of time and not always be um, just a period room. Um, furniture arrangement is really important to me. I go in some people's houses and they just put the furniture all around the room. I mean, this is sort of doesn't make any sense. I think you have to think in furniture groups because that's the way people talk to each other. And what makes a room comfortable is that you sit down, six or eight people can look at each other, they can hear each other, they can see each other, they have a little table to put their drink down, most important, and, uh, and proper lighting. And I think that's what I, I always start with the furniture group. When I go in any room, I think, where am I going to put the furniture? Now, this was a big room that I was able to have sofas back to back. So one group faces the fireplace when that's happening, and the other, the other section faces the other, other part of the room. And this room has a game table, it has a piano. Everybody, they wanted to make sure the family used this room all the time. And if you don't use a room, it's usually because you've got the wrong thing in there. And frankly, if you need to watch television, put it in the living room. It'll make you use the living room. Um, but, and big rooms often, again, this is a wonderful house in the south of France, but it was a long room. So there are two seating groups, and each seating group can hold eight or nine people. And that's how many people really can talk to each other. I also think it's very important today to have different types of chairs. Um, not everybody wants to get out of a big deep sofa or a big lounge chair. So I love smaller armchairs, things that are easy to get in and out of. And it's actually, you find people gravitate to those chairs and avoid uh, the big upholstered chair unless you want to curl up and read a book. So furniture should be a different scale and proportion in a room. Um, in a t this is a, um, a TV room upstairs, sort of sitting room, and I love these big L-shaped sofas. Everybody can pile their children, grandchildren, dogs, and stretch out and watch Netflix or whatever. Um, and this coffee table, which you'll see in a couple of my sl slides, is one I designed because I always like to put my feet up, but then I wanted something that I could put um, a drink down on or, or some food. So this is, we call it the tray chic ottoman. So you can sit on it, put your feet on it, and then it's got a tray in the middle that can hold the hors d'oeuvres or books or whatever. It really comes in handy. Um, this family room has swivel chairs that turn to, so you can watch the television. And this family said to me, um, I just want you to know that when you build this sofa, it's got to be um, able for four boys to do somersaults from the kitchen on it. And it's still holding up. So our upholsterer got very, uh, uh, I think he went all out to make sure the frame was very strong. And you can see on this sofa, I love to, I love to add cushions and throws and, and kind of make things have a personality of their own. It takes off the, the edge of it. It also is fun, you can change it. You know, if you get bored with the pillow or you don't like to throw, you can do something else. So you can always kind of be changing your room a little bit. I always want to have places for books, so I'm always looking for bookcases. This room, which is in East Hampton, a country house, again, the group has big comfortable chairs, pull-up chairs, a sofa, but everybody's comfortable and you know where to go when you're in that room. When you, if people come in and they don't know where to sit, you know the furniture is probably not in the right place. Uh, and this again is showing that the, in a big room the sofa is back to back. Um, we did this, this was a barn that, that I did for some clients, and she said, oh, this is the perfect room. She said, the men sit on one side where the television is and watch the football game, and the women sit on the other side and talk about how bad their children are. And everybody, everybody gets to stay in the same room. And I love rooms that have, this has a long table with dining chairs around it. I like a room that you can do a lot of different things in. So you can sit in them, you can have a meal in it, watch television. And those are the rooms that you really end up using all the time. Um, this is a big house in, in Florida, 
Um, and again, the thing that's so important is scale, of getting the scale of the furniture right. But again, you can see the same kind of grouping of, of furniture together, so it makes for easy conversation. Color. Everybody has color preferences. Uh, and it's one of the things when I'm working with clients, I have to figure out. Are they all beige people? Do they like a lot of color, no color? Uh, and, it's, and also, color is very much affected by where you are, where the light is. If I'm working in Florida, or I'm working in Aspen, Colorado, or the south of France, or the northwest corner, our lights are so different. And it's interesting, it's interesting when I look at colors in my office, and then I go out to, I'm working on a house in San Francisco. It's always gray out there. I mean, it is, so it's always hard to, you always have to go to the place and look at the color. This is a house that um, we worked on in Southampton, and the client called me up and she said, I want my living room to be the color of the living room in the movie Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> well, just go watch that movie, because every time the living room comes on, it is a different color. <laughs> So I was watching it. My, my partner Elizabeth was watching. The painter was watching. We must have watched this movie a hundred times. And it really was hard because we weren't sure which was the right color. But I'm very lucky that I do get to work with painters who mix the paint in the room, who I don't have to go to get a Benjamin Moore number. We really go out there and we mix it. It's, a, it's becoming a lost art. Um, but it was, it was very important in this color. And you can see how this, this contemporary art looks so great on a color. Sometimes I think contemporary pictures that are always shown on a white wall, it doesn't, it doesn't frame them, it doesn't make them pop. And this is a great art collection of photography, Joan Mitchell at the end, but the color, I think it just gives a great background for the pictures. This is another hall, it was a big sort of coal space and by using this sort of pumpkin color, uh, and again, a stencil floor, it made it kind of come alive. And again, it's a wonderful, the color was a great background for, for the artwork. Rooms can be very subtle. This is very just sort of neutral beiges, and keeping the tones together. So this, these are things that we work on. We, you know, I, somebody said, Do I, or is there a color I don't like? And I said, well, I hate to say that because I might like it next month because I'll figure a way, a way to use it with something else. And it's often the way you put color together. But, but this is a very, very soothing palette. Again, that strong blue. Um, and sometimes in a small room, if you use a strong color, it's good to have everything in the same color because it'll make the room seem bigger. If this sofa were red or beige, it would be too much. But if you take a color, use, it, use a lot of it together, and then you, you're not going to be overwhelmed. I, when I use color, I always have to think, too, of what, a color, what the color of a room is and what the next color is. So often, if I have a room that's a strong color like this, the hall's very neutral. So you never, I don't like a red, white, and blue house. I like to have some, you have to have some relaxing moment away from the color. Um, this is a, a bedroom in Florida, and when we were thinking, because I have to do these rooms and think of different colors, and I was looking at shells, and I looked at the inside of a conch shell, and it's the most beautiful beigey pink color. I mean, if you really look at it, it's a beautiful color. So we gave that to the painter, and that started the coloring for this room, uh, which is that color and, and just off-white. But of course, it looks beautiful in the in the Florida sun with the uh, light pouring in. It seems so right um, in that space. And I also think of, when I'm in a room, of what do I see outside? In this house, which had these plaster walls and stone trims, so the room was very neutral. And I kept looking out to the green of the, the garden and the ocean beyond. So we decided to do everything fairly neutral, and the only accent color would be the color of greens that we were seeing out. So when the doors are open, the room sort of, the color sort of comes into the room. And that's often where the color sense comes from. In this, you know, in, in cold climates, you can have more intense color because we have, our houses are closed up a lot, but in the, in the tropics, you, you want to open it up and very much think of the outside. Um, this library was in, in this house in, in Delaware, and it was a wood room, and it was the ugliest wood I've ever seen. I mean, there was nothing I could do. I couldn't stain it or polish it to make it pretty wood. 
And so I said to uh, the client, I said, you're going to really have a stroke, but I think we should ebonize it because a lot of wood was done where it was really ebonized. So we took this, it's still a wood room, the room was like this, but we did it, we, we ebonized it and it's shiny and all of a sudden the room really became alive where the wood that was, the real wood, was dry and dark and kind of depressing. So making the room even darker and shinier um, made, it, made it much more inviting. And this library is in, um, in New York. It's, it's actually one of my favorite colors. I always call it sort of a dirty, mossy green. It's not a beige, it has a lot of green in it, but it's the most wonderful neutral color because every color in the world looks good with it. So red books and blue and white china and anything you put with that color looks absolutely wonderful. Pattern. Some people like pattern, some people don't. But pattern is in everything. Pattern is in books. We have pattern around us all the time and it's how, how much more do we add to a room uh, and, and how do we use it. This dining room, we were able to find this extraordinary 18th century Chinese wallpaper. And so this became the pattern of that room and everything else was kept very neutral. Um, the rug is a modern rug, which I again love mixing something very contemporary with something that's old. I think the juxtaposition is really wonderful. And sometimes it's fun to use a pattern all in a room. I've always been, in <laughs> been inspired by the paintings of Viard and Matisse, where there were these wonderful pattern walls with things happening. So sometimes it's fun. And it really, if you, use, if you do the whole room in a pattern, it becomes less busy than if you have five patterns or you just use a little bit of it. It can be very soothing to just, so the, in this room, the walls, the curtains, the furniture was all done in this same uh, soft pattern. Uh, and sometimes pattern can help hide architectural problems. This bedroom was in the attic or the third floor of a house, and these low, very, uh, the uh, dormer window and the low um, ceiling, and just by putting the pattern all over it um, made, made the room interesting, more interesting than it really is architecturally. And they used to do that in France all the time. If you went up in chateaus in the top, you'd find a toile pasted all through the, the beams and it really can make a sort of wonderful cozy room at the top. This is a, another room with a beautiful wallpaper. This is a Zubair 19th century uh, paper that we were able to find that's gray. Um, these were printed in the uh, early, about 1820, uh, 1820 1810 uh, with scenes of, of ships and castles and we were able to do this, and then we kept the room very neutral, but just with this beautiful gray wallpaper. Um, and this room, which had awkward windows, there were they had window seats, windows the same size. By unifying the walls and the windows with this same small scale pattern, again, it helped to make up for the fact that nothing was symmetrical and there was no real geometry to the space. Um, and again, it's a, it, a small pattern, so it's a great background for hanging paintings. This is sort of one of, I always think, look at this and think of the VR paintings that I loved and know that that's sort of what inspired me for that. Um, this room is a wonderful, it's so much fun to have, have clients that they let you do things that you think of. This room is a, actually a decoupage room. I love decoupage, I love the idea that things are cut out and pasted on the walls. And this is, these clients were great gardeners, and I found a book of 18th century uh, engravings of, of, of flowers, and we, we copied them. This was done by a studio, um, and they got young, struggling artists to sit there and cut out all the flowers. And then it's pasted on silver paper, and we made this wallpaper for this room that is very special. And, something nobody else would do, I don't think, because they wouldn't take the time to do it. But it's, it's really unique, and it's so beautiful at night with candlelight, because the silver, it's the wallpaper that Gracie paints their wallpapers on. So at night, it's dull, but it has beautiful reflection of, of light at night. And scale is something so important. Um, I think one of the things, people get the scale wrong. Um, I like big things. I think even in a small room, putting something bigger is going to make the room seem bigger. And you also want a juxtaposition of big and little together. 
Not everything should be the same scale. In this hall, finding this big, this was a painting for a tapestry. Before they were going to leave tapestries, they often did the, the watercolor gouache for what they were going to then put on the loom. So this is just the watercolor that was done for the tapestry. I don't know if the tapestry was ever made. But it just filled up the wall in this hall and was exciting, and much more exciting than if you'd had just a small painting hanging over the sofa. And this hall, again, I found these uh, wonderful botanicals by Sarah Graham, who's their big irises, overscaled botanicals. Um, and it's, again, exciting in a space and warms up a big space. That table is a, uh, dra it's a, uh, probably a, from a milliner shop. It was a cutting table. We found it in the flea market in Paris. It's about 12 feet long. And it was what they would do draperies on. But it makes a great table. And again, mixing them with a pair of French painted chairs. Um, you just don't know when it's done. Screens are wonderful. I love buying screens because they, again, if you don't have a big artwork and you've got a space, find screens. They're often available. People don't know what to do with them, but they're just wonderful hung on the wall um, and really very, very special. Uh, again, this, these panels, this was probably a screen that we took apart and hung on this wall because the clients didn't have a lot of big art, but I needed something strong to hang on the space. Um, and the, again, this big rooms, I think you want some big furniture, but you also want the smaller intimate things. So I always try to get the, the big pieces in the room to anchor the room and then fill it in with little tables, smaller chairs uh, to make for intimate seating. But it's all about getting the scale right. And I think that's where a lot of rooms fall apart because there, it, it, there's, there's not that sense. And buying special things. Uh, I think John, my husband, has an antique shop. We spend most of our free time when we're not in the garden shopping. Because in the end, it's our things, the, the individual things that make, up, make a room special and make it yours. It makes it something other people don't have. So I'm always looking for tables. This table behind the sofa is a mid-century table by, I can't remember his, the designer's name, but the legs look like screws, giant screws. He did a suite of furniture with these screw things. And I just thought they were interesting. And so you end up having things that are, that are unique. I was shopping and I saw this carved drapery. Um, and it was maybe it had done, been done for a theater set or something. And I fell in love with it. And so I found that this is right outside a power room door. So we put a mirror on the wall and it becomes the frame of the mirror so people can see how they look when they come out of the power room. But it just makes that space a conversational thing. And you know, when you're looking, you find pieces of architecture, you find you know remnants of things, and it's fun to figure out how to make them into something. I, I, I love great furniture. Um, this is an incredible French 18th century Rajon's table, but again, putting it with contemporary art. This is what I think makes a room really, as I say, have a, have a sense of timelessness. But that piece of furniture to me just is like a ballet dancer. It's so beautiful. This table um, was one that I've never seen one like it. And it obviously was a table for somebody who had collected these intaglios, the, the little things. And they must have had so many, they went to a furniture maker and commissioned this table and said, I don't want to just hang them on the wall. Make me this table to um, hold my collection. So the frieze and the top, and um, it, it sits in this entrance hall. About five of my clients look at the book and they say, can you get me a table like this? And I said, no. And I said, it took somebody to collect all those and go to a cabinet maker and have it made. Um, but I think it sort of, it makes you think of, maybe I could make something with my collection. And this chair, this beautiful hall chair, which is English, um, you know, early, it's like a piece of sculpture to me. And that's when I think beautiful furniture will always, say, people say, oh, the young people aren't buying antiques. And I'm like, it's so sad because there, it's there, it's available, it's not even that expensive anymore. And it, you never get tired of looking at it. You just are always, every good piece of furniture we have, I'm always glad that, that I have it. And rooms with a purpose, again, as I've said it before, figure out what your room is gonna do and make it work. Whether it's a library, your desk, make your room spaces that you want to be in. 
Um, I don't know about you, but one of my favorite things in the world is I love Home Depot. You know those red cabinets that for the tools at Home Depot? I think they're so beautiful. And if you go look at them, you, your little finger can open the drawer. So I, I wanted to do a kitchen in it, but they don't have deep enough drawers for pots and pans. So in this house, we did a um, craft room, wrapping room. It's up, it was up in the third floor, and I used all the Home Depot um, metal cabinets for the, the cabinet work. So the kids' drawings are in there, her wrapping paper, all that sewing stuff, everything fits perfectly in it. Um, and it was sort of a fun thing, and, and the room gets used a lot. A lot of times now with third floors, we're making bunk rooms out of it. Families are growing, the grandchildren come, they need extra uh, beds. So it's fun to look at an attic space and think about building in bunks and having a place for them to hang out. Uh, this was a, in a house in Florida, and this is the big TV room. Across from this is a big television. But what's fun about this room, there's so many things you t can do now with modern technology. This room, I found images of Moroccan tiles from books. And you go to a, a person who has a computer, and they put in the, the size of the wall, and they elevate it, so it's all done on a computer. And when you get it the way you want it, it's sent to, it's done, it's photo printed. So there are these photo studios that could print something the size of that wall. And it's printed like wallpaper, and then it gets hung like wallpaper. So it looks like it's hand painted. It looks like, you know, is it a tile room? You don't know what it is. But it was all done on a computer, and then printed and hung on the wall. And I love trying to use new modern technology. This again is a big family room. There's the television. I love televisions today. They're this thin. If put them out there, and you kind of don't. You, if you don't like it, you can put a. Uh, uh, they have these things where you can put a painting on it. But this room, that's what this room is used for. So the chairs swivel, everybody can turn around, and it's a really comfortable uh, family television room. And the details, one of the things that in what I get to do is to think of all the little details. Our work is not just buying the furniture, but it's what you do with it. You know, in this little girl's room, to use grow grain ribbon to tie the, 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 um, the curtains together. We have these incredible uh, workrooms in New York that do beautiful embroidery. So on a headboard, we can um, make a pattern for it. And then this studio who, that's been there for, I don't know, 100 years, does all this work. And what's sad about it is that, that it, it's a company called Penn and Fletcher. And every time I go in there, they say, I can't get young people to do this work anymore. I mean, they won't be around in 15 years. They're getting older. They do theater costumes. I mean, they do, what they do is simply amazing. And what's sad to me is that it's all going away because younger people, they can't train them and they don't want to do it. Um, to have a workroom that can take the ribbon and sew it on, and this is all done with grow grain ribbon, but you make a pattern and they stitch it, stitch it on the curtains. And it's just exciting to know that there's still that many workrooms who, who can do that quality of work. And I love to, even for details, I love, as I said before, I love going textiles. I think you can just change your room immediately by having beautiful, you know, Suzani's or Indian textiles. We travel a lot. Every time we come back from India, we've got like five shopping bags or, or duffel bags of more things to throw over the, the beds or the sofa. And it's also great for the dogs um, because it doesn't ruin our upholstery uh, since we let our dogs on everything. Um, and just mixing pillows, doing things that a room can be changed immediately by just freshening them up with wonderful pillows and mixing different patterns together. Um, and this is, again, one of these wonderful things that is done with photography. I had a client who I went in her house, and there were five million photographs of the children, the grandchildren. Uh, I mean, I'm back. Um, and I said, you've got too many pictures here. So what we did is we took the pic a lot of the pictures of the trips that they'd had. And again, working with, with a computer, we blew them up and then printed them and we made this wallpaper. So it's all the, they go in and there they all are in front of the Eiffel Tower, or the you know, Buckingham Palace or wherever they went. And it's a, it's a fun way to use photography and you could do so much with it um, that's really interesting. Uh, and this wonderful, 
you know, big um, table, it's furnishing, it's putting things on it, it's finding the accessories. I always think in, in every room we're creating small still lifes within the big space. Everything, every surface has to be thought of, of what's on it, and it can move, but, um, and of course I'm partial to having drinks trays in every room so that everybody can help themselves um, and make your guests feel so much more comfortable. Um, again, the scale of objects having uh, big jars. This is, um, this was a funny story because um, this was a house I was doing with one of uh, America's top CEOs. If I told you, I can't tell you his name, but you would know it immediately. Very powerful man. And I did this house and I walked into it and when you opened the door, you saw the whole house. There were no, there was no front hall. You just looked out, saw everything. And I went in and I said, you need to put a wall up here. There were two columns. I said, you have to put a wall up here because there's no surprise. You walk, you open the front door, you see everything. It's not a mystery. He said, no, that's ridiculous. Stupidest idea I've ever <laughs> So I said, fine. I kept bringing it up. Didn't happen. The house got finished, painted. They were moving in it. Three months later, he calls me up and he said, put that, and I'm not going to say the word, he said, wall up. <laughs> so we have to go back and put the wall up because it was the whole sense of, you don't want to open your front door and just see everything. It all should unfold to you. But I've worked for him since, and he says, I'm not going to, I'm not going to cross you anymore. Do what you think <laughs> we need to do. And again, family photographs. Instead of having them all over the table, put them in a hall. Put them someplace that you see them, walk by them all the time. And frame them all alike. Um, and it's just a wonderful place to, to have them. And art, sometimes you don't have enough wall space. I love buying easels and sticking it in the corner and changing out. And John and I are always buying another picture. I'll probably buy some next week. And I don't have any wall space, but um, having some place that you can rest them on is wonderful. Um, and just looking at great objects, these wonderful big Balinese figures sitting on this table in Florida, um, kind of make the room have a personality and much more interesting. Um, and so now I'm going to move you a little bit locally to Falls Village. About four years ago, um, and when you come to the garden tomorrow, you will see this building and you can go into it. Um, there was a house behind our pool house that really was the ugliest house you've ever seen. It was so ugly, I don't even tell you how ugly it was. And my friend, uh, Lori Dunham, who was the broker, said, Bunny, you can't be serious, you want to buy this house. I said, yes I do, and I have a vision for it. And I always had wanted to make a studio, a place I could work and come and stay up here a little bit more, I have an excuse to stay a little bit more. So this house that you see now, I, this, I have a before picture in the book, had a deck around it. It was, the front door was up at, on the, they didn't come in on the, the lower level. And it was a uh, four bedroom, three bedroom house, sleeping loft, a kitchen, a living room, and um, the basement was unfinished. So I just could not wait to get my hands on it. So now the basement is the entrance hall, because I wanted to come in on a lower level. So we made this hall, it has stone floors, there's tiles, because it's very low ceiling. But you come into a lower level, uh, and then off of it is a, a room that could be a bedroom, and there's a little alcove. Um, and I put, I have been collecting these needlepoint pictures for years, and I put them away because I thought, I thought they looked a little granny. And then I got them out I, because they're so beautiful. And so I hung them all together, sort of making a collage out of them in the corner of this room, which is my gym, which I should go into more often. But I said I was never going to go into it if it wasn't pretty. So um, we can open the doors. Um, and I found this beautiful tapestry behind it. And of course, there's a television on the other wall. Uh, but it is kind of a nice place to go up um, and work out. And then the four-bedroom house and the kitchen became this room. I wanted one big space, and I wanted a glass end to look over the countryside. You know, an old house doesn't have a view, really. Our house has smaller windows. It was built to keep in the heat. And, you, and also, this house sits high on the property. So it was, it was amazing. I'm supposed to work up here. I have my drafting table, I have my books, my computer, but I do find that I do sit down in that chair and look at the clouds an awful lot, because uh, it's a marvelous space. But if you come to the garden tomorrow, this is open and you're welcome to come see it. 
flower arranging. I think every house we should have flowers. Here we're talking about flowers. And you know, I like to cut flowers from the side of the road, even if you don't have a garden. There are so many things, Queen Anne's lace. And the main thing is to have small containers, have it where it's easy to do. Uh, I, I love to do them. Um, and they're kind of loose and airy, and um, I just put them together. Cause, and sometimes you just can go, now you can buy great plants at Home Depot. So if you don't want, feel you want to do flowers, bring something alive in the house. I think it makes all the difference in the world. And certainly I love to do something in the front hall and uh, whatever is in season. But it's having the right container, having some chicken wire, and making it easy for yourself, not overthinking it. Uh, I like my flower arrangements very loose and airy, and I cut a lot of shrubbery to put in with the flowers uh, to make it happen. And again, um, it can just be a pretty plant in the front hall. This is one of my clients whose dogs I adore. Um, and again, just little touches in a room to me make all the difference in the world. Can't for, wait for my lily of the valley to start blooming, and uh, I can bring those in. Entertaining. People should entertain. I always say, even if you go buy the food, have people in your house, entertain. Even if people say, oh, I don't want to cook. Well, you don't have to cook anymore. There's prepared food all over the place. But get out your plate, set the table, and it's so much more fun to be in somebody's house. You can hear, you can talk, and it's, to me, it's a wonderful gift. Um, we obviously will be in this room if you come to the garden. In the conservatory, we eat here all the time. Uh, I love mixing tablecloths with flowers and have tablecloths that are Indian bedspreads, all kinds of different things. And so my husband, luckily, is a great cook, so he cooks and he'll say to me, oh, go do one of your tablescapes. So <laughs> that's what I really love doing. And, you know, just using plates, placemats, and having people together, excuse me, is so, to me, so important, and to be at home in the summer to be outside, uh, and eat outside, and as I say, just have a big salad and people are happy. This is in the garden in the house in the south of France. Who wouldn't want to eat there? Um, <laughs> a baguette and some pate, or just, who needs more? Uh, and also in, uh, for entertaining, be prepared. For instance, in our house we always have a drinks tray. There, our friends come, they can help themselves, you make it relaxed. If you, if you have everything ready, your guests will be relaxed. And I don't put the bar in the kitchen because they can't find it. So I have a tray, and the things are out, a nice bucket and glasses, and people just know to go and help themselves. The bottle of wine is open, and everything is pretty casual in our house. Another one here in this living room, we just set up this table, and there it is, and it's always ready to go. And you don't, I think it makes people much, much more relaxed. So I thought I would just speak a minute about the garden in Falls Village and its evolution. Um, if whoever comes today, don't think that this happened overnight. Um, 37 years ago, I turned in the driveway and I fell in love with this house even before I went into it. These um, locust trees, these giant trees, and this funny old house was sitting there and I knew I had to live there. And over 37 years, I've created this garden uh, I've had the wonderful help of so many people, uh, starting Debbie Munson, who is local, was worked with me for years. Um, um, Eric Rucrest, who lived in Falls Village, who lives in Falls Village, where Brian, uh, Bridget Lynch, who uh, many of you know uh, now, Robert Reimer and his wife, Tricia Van Ors, who are sitting here, have come. I, this garden is a partnership with all of these people. Um, I have visions, I know what I want it to look like, but I don't always know what's going to grow, or what's the right thing, and I, it's really been a partnership. So the garden has gone over a period of time. When I bought it, there was nothing, the lawn hadn't been mowed, um, the, it, was, it was pretty bad. I even had to take out some of the big trees because the house is getting no light, no sun. So a couple trees that size had to be removed. Um, the box I planted to the front door that nobody goes in. Um, and uh, this is the what we call the sunken garden. And this was the sunken garden many, many years ago. It was um, a grass lawn 
Um, I never really liked the garden, and the gardens have changed as I've gone on garden trips with friends and seen things or been inspired. So this is the garden that you'll see tomorrow. Um, it, beds got divided up. It became just a much more interesting space. And John and I, John and I now go down here all the time um, because we got the design right. Uh, and I'm always, I'm always just like on the interior. I always fuss with how it feels, and it has to feel right. The scale of it has to feel right, and then the plants and um, the things come in. But this is, um, this is after going to Normandy and seeing a Russell Page garden, which. My, my garden trips, they, they're not that expensive, but what I do when I get back really is. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have been to, uh, we've been to uh, look at the, uh, in Belgium to look at the Verts gardens. And the back of the house had a big lawn and it just didn't connect. One of the part of the garden didn't connect to the other part. And so I got this idea to do this, this shaped hedge. And this is it very early on. Um, and this is how small it was, so when you come and see it, you'll see it in a totally different... Uh, but this is how you start. I mean, you buy them small, and you've got... It's taken seven years, but it's finally reached... Um, it's, it's looking almost perfect. <laughs> we have one book. <laughs> and uh, then this is the, uh, this is the parterre garden. Um, this is off the barn. Those three windows I bought, I was going to Guido's in Great Barrington a number of years ago, and those windows were leaning against the junk store. There was a junk, great junk store, Reggie, and he had those windows just leaning against the building. And I said, oh, I just have to have those windows. And I had a tiny little greenhouse, uh, which was 32 feet long, which luckily I recycled and is now at Jane Garmey's. And um, the foundation was 32 feet, so um, we put the conservatory on, and this sort of became the nucleus for this parterre, uh, parterre garden. Um, and you can see the other, the, the thing about gardens is, to me, is that they, they have to have a road map. You have to leave from one space to another. This is my design thing. So you come from the, the hedge, you come under the arbor, you move through that garden, and then you come up through the steps into um, that leads you up to the woodland garden. Um, also, our swimming pool. John and I were in France. We, as Jane said, when we had the shop, we used to go to Europe twice a year to buy. And John said, "I think we need a swimming pool." And so I said, "Well, I don't really like a swimming. I don't want to look at a swimming pool all year because we only get to swim in it for about 15 minutes." And <laughs> so, um, and short. Um, Falls Village has all this Greek Revival architecture. So I got this idea, I had seen a picture of a wooden temple, and so I had one of my architects uh, scale out a perfect wooden temple, and a um, wonderful carpenter, Gerald McMahon, built it. He went and found somebody who was clear cutting the woods, cut the poles, and built. The, we built the, the pool house, and the, the freeze is pine cones. Um, and this is, mm -hmm. uh, this is the way you walk up to it. Uh, through a, through an orchard, a grass path lined with uh, with ornamental grasses, and there's the pool with these beautiful stones that we brought back from Europe, and a um, wonderful wonderful place to swim early in the morning. And and the last slide of the garden is going to show you the beginning of the woodland garden, and I hope you'll come tomorrow because it looks quite different. <laughs> um, but this is how you have to be patient, you have to start, it all has to be small, and you have to just understand. This woodland garden was one of the hardest things because I wanted to plant all these things, and of course they didn't like it. They didn't want to grow there. I planted on Mount Laurel. There's Mount Laurel all over. Mount Laurel hates it there, all done. <laughs> so you, it's trial and error, but uh, finally we found the things, and whatever loved it, I got more of it. Um, and. We do have this wonderful home collection. If you go online, you'll see it. Uh, there's one of our sofas and my wonderful Annabelle, who is, was a terrible terrier, and now she's on um, dog biscuits with CBD oil, and so she's <laughs> really <laughs> So if you come, you will not be bitten. <laughs> but 